joining us this evening. Well, it's another snowy evening, so I guess this is a good time to have one of these. So I'll go ahead and uh, share the screen and let's get started with Chrysicaria. Okay, should be able to see everything now, right? Yep. All right, so we're looking at, yeah, we're looking at um, Persicaria. This is the um, revised genera for the smart weeds. Um, you may know that under either Zerosa, and you'll see in the table that I put together, like I usually do, that it used to be under polygonums, but the uh, polygonums were split apart in FNA into the knot weeds, which are polygonums, and Persicaria, which are the smart weeds. Got a couple pictures here of a couple plants that were in the wetland book that I did a few years ago. You can see um, both of these will be taken a closer look at, of course, but the one on the left is a real common one in, in wetland environments, uh, Persicaria amphibia, water smart weed. And then the one on the right is also, and, and as you probably know, most of these are common in wet environments, but uh, the one on the right is uh, Persicaria sagittata, uh, arrow leaf smart weed. So when we look at uh, smart weeds, one of the things I think I want to say, first of all, is that they're all pretty ecologically important. When you think about the function of smart weeds, um, most of them are fairly ruderal species. Many of them are an annual species. So they're very important in early successional types of environments. Many of them are very important in providing food for wildlife. The seeds, of course, are very important. Well, actually, I should say the fruits, the fruits which contain a single seed, are used by a lot of wildlife. There's over 20 species of ducks, uh, geese, bobwise, morning doves, pheasants, rails, lots of non-game birds, uh, lots of birds eat the seeds. And of course, in wetland environments, you'd expect uh, a lot of ducks and wa water birds. They also are used by um, small mammals, of course, mice and even muskrats and, and fox squirrels. So they're very important as a food. They're very important in early succession, successional environments, as I said. And uh, probably because of that role in early successional environments, they have pretty long dormancy in the seed bank. There's been some studies that have um, determined that many of the smart weed species can be viable in the seed bank for uh, at least 30, maybe 40 years, which suggests then that if any kind of restoration work is being done in a wetland type of environment that maybe hasn't had a wetland for a while, there could be some seed there yet. So we'll, we'll take a look at, um, take a look at the family. My computer's not going, there we go. Take a look at the family here first that smart weeds are in. Uh, Polygon ACE, a little background um, information here for you. So the, it's a medium sized family, I would say. Polygon ACE, you see there globally uh, about 50 genera and 1,200 species. North America, uh, 35 genera, over 400 species. And in Iowa, um, currently under the current classification under FNA, we have six genera and 35 species. I uh, made a, a slight correction here from your handout. Others in Rosa, the checklist of Iowa vascular plants uh, has four genera and 31 species. So when uh, FNA was done, it added two genera. And the genera that it added were basically fallopia. This one right here, the false buckwheats used to be polygonum. And now the false buckwheats are fallopia. Then, as I said earlier, Persicaria, the genus Persicaria was split out for the smart weeds. So these are the, the genera that we have in Iowa. Phygopyrum is a cultivated buckwheat. There's just one species. It's, it doesn't really um, persist very long. It might escape from cultivation, but usually doesn't last too long. Uh, four fallopias again. Um, fallopia scandens is the only native one. The other three are non-native. Twelve smart weeds we're taking a look at. Uh, the species Polygonella 
articula articulata is um, only representative for that genus. And within the family of, of Polygonaceae, it's the only endangered and threatened species. It's listed as an endangered species in Iowa. There's only about 13 populations that are known in about eight counties. And the last observation was about 20 years ago. It's a species that lives in um, lives on very dry, sandy types of environments. So sand prairies and sandstone outcrops and things like that. Polygonum are the knotweeds and then rumix are the docks. Now, um, before we get into the key features of polygonaceae, I might just add one more thing. Uh, the 442 species of polygonaceae in North America, half of those are one genus, er, 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 the genus Eroganum, which is wild buck, buckwheat. We don't have any Eroganum in Iowa. It's, um, it's more of a Western species. There are some species that are to the south of us too, but um, that one is a is a huge genus. It's actually the fourth largest genus in North America, after Carex, which is the largest genus, and then um, let's see Penstemon and Astragalus. So key features of Polygonaceae. There's three things I want to mention here. Uh, the ochria is a very important key feature, vegetative one. The ochria is this little sheath you see. Let me get my pointer here, I guess. Uh, is um, the sheath that we see right in here. And it's always at the node of a leaf. It's actually considered to be part of the leaf. There's different opinions on um, how it's formed or what it comes from. There are some that believe it's uh, just a... Uh, Fuse stipules, so stipules that are usually paired at the base of the leaf. Uh, they are at the bottom of the petiole where the petiole joins the node. So if it could be that they're enlarged and fused stipules. Another idea is that um, it's just an outgrowth of sheathing that could be a part of the petiole, a sheathing base. Nonetheless, it is this sort of tubular, very easy to see in spot, uh, sort of sheath that extends up the stem from the node where the leaf is attached. Now, not all of the polygonaceae have an ochria. The, the family is divided into two subfamilies, and the um, uh, subfamily that contains what we're going to be looking at, the persicarias and the rumex and fallopias, that subfamily does have the ochria. The other subfamily uh, is the er eroganums, the wild buckwheats. They do not. The beginning, we don't have any of those in Iowa. And we'll see that there's different features that we'll talk about with respect to it in terms of um, particularly whether or not it has any bristles that come off the top margin. This diagram here and this example here do not. But when we look at the um, Persicaria and start keying them out. That's one of the first splits. In terms of the flowers on Polygonaceae, this is called a flower diagram, and it's just a very simplistic way of sort of representing the main flower parts. The these structures out here around the outer edge are the sepals. These in the next world going in are the petals. These little eights represent the paired anthers of stamens. And then this thing in the center here represents the pistil, which um, in this case, it looks like it's sort of triangular, which means that it's made from, it's a, it's a compound pistil made from three carpels. And then there's one ovule represented there. So the perianth of the polygonaceae are usually described as tepals. Here we can see an example here of, um, this one is uh, Persicaria pennsylvanicum. All of the sepals and petals look alike. We can't really determine, well, on this diagram up here, again, the sepals are on the outside and petals are on the in, inside. And we could probably figure that out by looking at this really close. But since they all look very similar, they're all the same size, they're all the same color, 
we use the term tepal, T-E-P-A-L, to represent the perianth parts then. And so typically, uh, polygonacy will have six tepals or five tepals. Now, there's a few that have four. So four, five, or six. And again, it kind of breaks down by, G by genus. This, this example here would be representative of erogonums, the buckwheats, and rumex, the docks. They have, they have six in two whorls of three. But the persicari, which we're going to be looking at tonight, they are usually four or five. Uh, the polygonums are five, the knotweeds, fallopia, the um, false buckwheats are five. So, and it's not clear for sure which is the uh, sort of the um, original condition. There are, there are some people that think the, the, the family originally had six, and so having four or five represents a reduction. That seems to be the most common uh, thought there. But they're real simple little flowers, and it, when it comes down to keying and figuring out which species you've got, you really don't use the flowers very much except for flower color. But the only thing you ever see in a key is, is what the color of the, of the tepals are. The next thing we're going to look at is the fruit. So in Polygonaceae, the fruit is an akene, which means that it's a dry fruit. It doesn't have any you know, fleshy material like a, like a cherry or a grape. It's a dry fruit. The pericarp is very thin and dry. Um, and since it's also called a keen, it means it has one seed inside the fruit. Each fruit just has one seed. And since it's called a keen, it also means that the fruit doesn't split open on its own. It, um, it has to, the pericarp, which is the fruit wall, it has to just wear down and, and break apart over time. What we'll see, again, the fruit can be pretty important uh, for some species IDs, and there's two possibilities in terms of the shape of the fruit, which is uh, usually an important characteristic. They can be trigonous or basically three-sided, and of course that's what would happen if you had a pistol that looked like this. If there's three carpels that fuse together to form the compound pistol, then it's very likely that the fruit's going to have a, a three-sided shape to it. But there's only if there's only two carpels, and again, the pistol can be either two or three carpels. Depends upon the genus and depends upon the species somewhat. If there's only two carpels that fuse together to form the compound pistol, then the fruit would look like these over here, and these would be described as lenticular or shaped like a lens. All right, so we are ready to take a look at some species. And so before we go into the pictures here, I did something a little bit different this time than I've done before. A lot of times I've, I try to weave a key into the PowerPoint, but I decided to just go ahead and write a key and present it to you as keys normally are presented in just a text format. And we'll take a look at the table too. Uh, real quick to get a quick look at those 12 species of, of uh, persicaria that we have. So let's, we'll look at the table here first. So here again is a table where I put a whole bunch of information for you about the species of concern. Tonight's going to be a lot simpler than last week. Uh, again, we were doing ferns last week and we had, uh, there were a lot of fern species. We've only got 12 species of persicaria to deal with here. So a uh, lot shorter here, of course. So again, but I added some things to this. So I wanted to just take a moment to explain this. Again, here's the same headings as usual. And again, if you haven't seen one of these before, um, this is a column that I kind of start with because this one is the column that shows the nomenclature according to the checklist of Alders and Rosa, which again is the only checklist that we have in Iowa. So that's what we work with. And then a common name, uh, if there's an equal sign, that means it's a synonym that either is a Rosa list. And then uh, in this column, I'm, this time I'm putting what the lifespan is um, and what the height of the shoots are. So the plant itself, the above ground part of the plant is called the shoot. And then a little bit of information about the potential for vegetative growth. Um, this one here, polygonum or now persicaria amphibia, 
does have rhizomes and or stolons, so it can grow into small clones. Then um, floor of North American nomenclature, of course, is what I wish everybody used uh, and what we're aiming for. This shows, of course, now the correct name is Persicaria amphibia. And just to, just to know, maybe you haven't, in case you haven't caught this before, but there's always a need to have the Latin name um, be um, appropriate gender-wise, you might say. And so when the genus uh, ends in polygonum, that means the species epithet will probably end in U-M as well. So that's why we got polygonum, amphibium. But now since the new genus is Persicaria, that's a neutered uh, gender, I believe. And so that has to change the species name to amphibia. You'll see in many of the Persicarias, there are lots of synonyms. This is a genus that's had just all kinds of uh, taxonomic turnover, it seems like. And I don't know for sure what explains that other than perhaps just a lot of mis- not mis, mis IDs per se, but um, misuse of names in terms of naming the species, not following the right rules and in, in naming species, perhaps is one reason. Uh, perhaps some of these represent uh, varieties that were normally or were at one time considered to be separate. I'm not sure, but um, we can see that there's at least five synonyms here that floor of North America lists here for Persicaria amphibia. Then I, uh, again, what the status is in terms of its, uh, what, it, what its origin is, native species or not, what the coefficient of conservatism is. And then since these are all wetland species, or, or at least uh, mostly wetland species, I put the current uh, wetland plant list category that the species is listed for. So this is this is called the wetland list, and basically you've got uh, five options for the most part here. This comes from a it, there's a reference at the end of the table that shows you where this comes from, but it comes from the most recent version of that list, which is managed by the Army Corps of in, Engineers. But OBL means obligate wetland species, so that means it's found in a wetland 99% of the time. If you were to just look at 100 random locations or vouchers for this species. What this would suggest that out of 100 random vouchers or sightings or whatever, um, 99 or more of them would be in a wetland type of an environment. We use negative five just as a numeric scalar when we want to try to calculate an average uh, for what the wetland index might be. These wetland uh, ca categories are uh, again, ob obligate wetland species, <clears throat> which is minus five again, or facultative wetland species, which is minus three, or facultative, which means it sits right on the border between wetland and upland. And so 50% of the time that species would be found in a wetland and 50% of the time it would not be. That's a facultative species, has an has a index again of zero. And then on the upland side is there's facultative upland, which is three, and upland, which is five. Then we've got the habitat here, and this comes from a variety of sources. I, I usually look at floor of North America, I look at floor of Missouri, I look at floor of Michigan, I look at floor of Nebraska, and then the Iowa and United States biogeography. These are all mostly based on BONAP. And then basically what this map is just sort of a, a translation of what you see right there. All right, so that's kind of what this table is all about. Here is a new species, uh, Persicaria bungiana. Uh, it was not included in Islanders and Rosa in 1994. This species uh, is, well, and the blue shading over here in bone out means it's not native. And of course it says not native there. This species was first discovered in a, in a Minnesota soybean field in 1984, and it's really only been found in uh, cultivated field type si situations. The, um, the map, the original Bonap map had it for Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois, they, but they didn't have any counties shown for Iowa. And I talked to Deb Lewis at the herbarium and she said there is a voucher at, in the herbarium at Iowa State, and the location of the voucher is 
Winnebago County right there, which makes sense because there's a county right across the line in Minnesota right there that has it too. But then I was reading in Florida, Nebraska, um, there's also been a record for in South Dakota now and also Nebraska. They don't have an official record yet, but they think it probably does occur probably someplace along the Missouri River. So this is, this again, not native species, but it is now, technically speaking, I guess, uh, in our flora. So I've included it here and included it in the key. Then we got a couple more uh, non-native species, although um, Persicara hydropiper, which is you know, either water pepper or pepper smartweed, um, that one is a difficult one because it looks like there are both native and non-native populations in North America. Uh, it seems that this is a circumboral species, and so there probably were native populations. I know that there's been some, um, there are records for it going back to the 1880s, vouchers that were collected in the 1880s, which certainly su suggests that it must be native, um, but now there's also um, evidence apparently that there's non-native populations. And I don't know, um, uh, I mean, it's the same species, so it's, it's uh, not going to be hard, or it's not going to be easy to tell it apart. So it's kind of a tough one to deal with. We did give it a coefficient of co of uh, conservatism uh, because we feel we do have native populations. Um, so, and, and you'll see it treated differently by different flora. Uh, Missouri treats it as totally native. Michigan treats it as, again, possibly a mixture of, of both. All right, um, what else? So hydropyperoides. Um, this one is one of the few perennials along with Persicaria amphibia. And, and in many cases, you'll see again, um, most of these annual species, they have a tap root, of course, like an annual species, but they will also produce some roots from the base of the stem. Uh, it says here roots often arising from the proximal nodes. Proximal means closest to the origin of the plant. So the, 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 the seed that the plant grew from, uh, so at the base of, of the stem. Some plants do that and some plants don't. And that is one thing that does show up in the key to separate species in some cases. Uh, let's see, this one is a little bit less of a wetland species. It's a fact W. Um, Orientalis here is a non-native species. This one was introduced as a garden plant. It's a, it can be really big. It can get up to two and a half meters in height. Uh, it's um, probably mainly only ever really seen in cultivated situations. I've not really seen it uh, escape anywhere, but um, there's a possibility for it. You can see it's, it's kind of sporadic in the state. It's got a couple of uh, cool names. Kiss Me Over the Garden Gate is one of the common names for it. And it's a, it's a facultative species, so it, it will grow in drier soil. Then uh, pinkweed, one of the most common ones is uh, Persicaria pennsylvanica. Um, this one does show up in the um, Christensen and Mueller Iowa Prairie Plants book as a plant that can be found in wet prairies. So that's where this map comes from. It is a uh, very much a root roll species. Its coefficient is one, as you can see there, which means it's way at the bottom there of, of the scale. We got a couple. Oh, we got another uh, non-native one. This is probably the most common non-native one, and it might be one that gets just a little bit um, invasive or aggressive. You might say it's not nearly as bad as um, it's a non-native one that grows in. Uh, let's see. It's out in the eastern part of the country more. It's called mile a minute. And that gives you a sense of how fast it spreads, I guess. It's a, it's a um, annual species that's more of a vine. It's kind of similar to our uh, two vining species. And one of the vining species, again, is this new one I just pointed out here earlier, Bungenia. It's, um, it's somewhat of a vining species. And then the native one, which is coming up, uh, Persicara sagittata. So it's similar to that, it vines, and um, it's, it's said to be able to grow up to six inches per day. So that's a terrible invasive species out east. Let's hope we don't get it over here. 
but you should be on the watch out for it probably. All right, we were looking at, yeah, so that's, uh, this is um, ladies' sum. It's a real common uh, non-native species. You can see it's in every single county. It's mildly invasive. I, I wouldn't say it's a real terrible one, but um, maybe just a little bit. Then here's the sagittatum, the, the arrow leaf, tear thumb or swamp or a smart weed. It's a obligate wetland species. Here's probably one of the most common ones as far as uh, you know, finding it in uh, wetland environments. And this one can behave either as an annual or a perennial dotted smart weed. That's probably one of this one and probably um, Hydro Piper are the two I see the most. But then the last one here is not a wetland species at all, really, but this is this is jump seed. This is the species that we see in our, our music uh, forests and floodplain forests. All right, so that's a quick look at the table. Now, I'm going to pull up the key. What happened to it? Mm -hmm. Nope, looks like it somehow it slipped away from me here. So I gotta find it again here. And we'll start with the key. Okay, so you have this key, it's at the back of the handout. And uh, as I said, tried to, tried to maybe do it this way. This might be a little bit easier in terms of not having to try to put so much typing and, and text on the actual PowerPoint. We can jump back and forth a little bit here between this key and, and, the, and the PowerPoint. So if you're going to start out with Polygonaceae, um, you would, again, use this first character up here, whether there's an Ocrea or whether there are Ocrea, that's plural or not. So okra E absent, again, is going to go to the subfamily that has the buckwheats in it, the wild buckwheats in it, and okra E, or again, plural, okra E present, persistent, nose more swollen, is going to go to the family we want to be in, the plegonoidae E, where persicaria is. So that's just, again, how to separate those two families apart. Then we're going to jump to the plegonoidae E, and we're not going to worry about trying to key out all the other genera here. Um, not really time for that. And just jump right into the genus Persicaria. And we've got 12 species in here again. And so the way we would first start out here is to separate the two species that are climbing. They're somewhat viney. The term scandent simply means that it's a species that climbs, but it doesn't use tendrils. Tendrils are those modified leaves or leaflets that wrap around a plant or a structure to help a, a species climb. But scan it means it's it's climbing without that. And so these just basically climb by their growth. And these climbers also have these prickles on the, on the stems and petioles. Um, prickles are sort of reinforced hairs. They're really strong, tough hairs. They're modified hairs. And these are, and they're usually pretty sharp. Uh, Retrorse means that they're pointed downwards. And so species that are again climbing and have these prickles on them, we're going to go to two. And we have again these two species right here. Bungiana, that one that's only known from one place in Iowa. Uh, non-native species, and then our more common wetland species, uh, sag Sagittata. You separate them basically by looking at the shape of the okra E, um, or also just looking to see whether they've got bristles on the okra. You can usually separate them by the leaf bases too. <laughs> so there's several things in here. Sagittata is going to have a leaf base that's lobed or sagittate or sort of heart shape. It's going to have two lobes that come down below the uh, base of the leaf and bungenia, which is again, the uh, prickly uh, smart weed does not have that. So we can take a look at that uh, right here. 
And I think I might just go ahead and leave it like this because um, then it'll be easier to go back and forth. But does this work? Can you see this slide, Lance? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think it might just be a little easier. Well, I can probably go up like this. You might be able to see things a little bit better this way, I suppose. Okay, so here's those two species. Here's Sagittata. The um, the prickles right here, downward pointing reach horse prickles. On, on Sagittata, the prickles are on the angles of the stems. They're not just scattered everywhere. Uh, they're in rows, basically on the angles, the corners of, of the stem. Here's a picture of the ochria right here um, versus, well, let me go ahead and pull up these other. There's a picture of the, the leaves a little bit better. Now you can see the, the sagittate uh, leaf bases right here, these lobes that point downward. Uh, they don't com completely wrap around the stem right here, but they're very clearly have these strong lobes at the base of the leaves. And again, here's the flowers. All the persicaria are going to have you know, five tepals. They're usually white. Again, we won't be using the flowers very much uh, to key things out, just the flower color. There's not very many pictures of Persicaria bungiana uh, out there because there's not many places where it grows. But here you can kind of see, here's a picture of, there's some of those prickles. They're not nearly as many of them. They're not in rows, they're just kind of scattered. Uh, you can look at the um, ochria right here. It's kind of hard to see. You might have to blow this up on your computer to get a better look at it, but there should be some hairs on it. And there are some cilia. Uh, there as, as well and on the top of it. I mean, we don't see that over here. So pretty easy to, to separate those. All right, let's go back to uh, the key here. And now we're going to go with three here, the other part of one here, not climbing, you know, usually growing erect or at least ascending somehow. Stems do not have prickles. That's going to take us to all the rest of them. And so we go to three here. Now we're going to separate out jump seed, uh, Persicaria virginiana. That's the one that grows more in forest environments. And it's basically separated out on the basis of its inflorescence. It has an inflorescence that's much um, more elongate with flowers much more spaced out. Uh, it does have some differences too in terms of the fruits. And we can take a look at those on the, on the pictures. It, it has just four tepals, whereas again, most of the other Persicaria now are going to have five. And when it, when it shows um, a measurement or a number like this, uh, and here we see it too with the um, leaf blades, how broad they are. Uh, for example, up here, this range 4.3 to 9 centimeters is the main range, but what the parentheses always show with a number inside the parentheses, either on the lower side or upper side, is like, that's like the extreme case. Sometimes it can be as narrow as four centimeters or sometimes as broad as 10. And what's, that's what this bracket means here, There's or these parentheses mean here. Sometimes, sort of rarely, you might find some other species uh, continuing on in this key that just have four. So we look at, um, and oh, well, let me say one more thing. Uh, there's 12 uh, Persicaria, and I kind of have them arranged in pairs that really fit together really well, but there's not another species that fits together really well with Persicaria virginiana. So I just picked one that was another sort of loner, uh, which is this last one down here, Persicaria hydropiperoides, and uh, put those together on the same sheet, which you're going to see here next. So here again is a uh, jump seed. You can see these really elongate inflorescences. You probably you know, I'm sure you've probably seen this species growing in the forest. It's a really distinctive species. Here's the ochria, fairly pubescent, fairly broad uh, elliptic leaves. Here's a close-up of the flowers. There's the uh, flower again with only one, or should be with four tepals. And um, the bottom picture there is the fruits. The fruits uh, develop 
uh, persistent styles. The style is persistent and the styles kind of become hardened and form kind of a beak on the fruit. And that beak is used as a way to, that, that hard beak is kind of used as an attachment mechanism to attach the fruit to, to fur. Uh, drum seed actually has a mechanism that it ejects or throws out the fruit from the, uh, from the plant. So that's a pretty easy one again to recognize. Here is the uh, hydropyperoides then. Uh, again, we'll, and we'll see how it keys out in the, in the key in just a little bit. Uh, it's probably most similar to uh, hydropiper, I suppose, or it kind of keys out with uh, Persicaria maculata and Persicaria uh, longicida, those two species. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll see what are the distinguishing things. Here, here's one thing you can see right here is that Ocrea has these bristles. So these cilia or bristles that come off the top margin of it right there. That's a key way to separate out the persicaria into a couple of different groups. And by the way, um, some persicaria leaves have these little splotches on the leaves. That's somewhat helpful, but there's a number of species that have those, including this species right here. You can find it quite often. It'll have a purple splotch there. Um, Persicaria mac maculata uh, often does. So it, it's not always a very reliable thing because a number of species have them, but then in each case, those species may or may not have them. So um, it's not used much in, in keying them out. All right, let's jump back to the key and see what we're going to do next here. We're going to um go beyond virginiana here now um so again this is the one about the inflorescence being you know elongated and spread out and this was inflorescence is shorter often densely flowered flowers are more clustered there's only either one or three styles and this one up here again has two styles that become again firm and hard as i said persistent and hooked for seed for fruit dispersal um these don't have that. These do not have any kind of a beak on their on those uh, fruits at all. And again, they have mostly five tepals. And that's going to take us to four now. And then we're going to split again on the basis of the ochria. Um, with if the ochria has these flange-like tips or top to them, and you'll see a good picture of them in just a little bit. Then we're going to go to five. And five means we're going to get either amphibia or orientalis. Now, when you see uh, this, Persicaria amphibia, and then it says in part, that's a way of me telling you that Persicaria amphibia keys out here, but it's also going to key out another place in the key because it's possible that you might have a Persicaria amphibia that would fit six, would fit this description better. And so that would take you past five, but you still need to have some way of coming to the right answer. So um, this one will key out a couple places. So again, we're looking at the, the uh, characteristic here with the, the uh, flange-like tips along the upper part of the ochria, the top part of it. Uh, leaf blades here are, are very broad, very ovate or elliptic. The um, tepals are usually bright reddish, pinkish, bright pink or so. And the inflorescences here are always terminal. Um, the other couplet here, again, is going to be mostly opposite, of course, all those things, different shapes of the leaves. Tepals generally white, pale green, or slightly pink, um, sort of reddish pink in uh, Longicida, as it says here. Um, but the thing with the inflorescences, well, these other persicarias, they can have terminal inflorescences too, but they also will have axillary ones. These two, this up here means that um, this couplet is describing the inflorescence as only terminal. You only find them at the very tip of the stems. This one here is saying they can be at the tip of the stems, but they'll also be axillary, which means that they come out of the upper leaf axles. So they, they come off the plant at a lower position. And that's the case for almost all the persicarias. 
So let's take a look at these two. Uh, you'd separate amphibia and orientalis. Remember, orientalis is that one that's a um, introduced as a or, uh, ornamental plant. Basically, you can separate them somewhat by their size, uh, although they overlap quite a bit there. Amphibia does root at the lower nodes, and orientalis does not. Um, see, another one here is the hairiness. Um, amphibia is pretty glabrous. Uh, for the most part, with maybe some short oppressed hairs on the, the leaves in some places. Uh, the oppressed means that they're flat, laying flat down against the surface of the leaf if they are, are there. And the inflorescences, again, are, are solitary or paired at the tip, and they, they tend to be more pointing straight upwards. Whereas in orientalis, they're more nodding, meaning that they're bending over. And the pubescence on orientalis is much more um, spreading and it's, you know, it's not pressed down against the base of the leaf or, or the surface of, of the leaf. Soft and spreading hairs means that they're going to be more erect and kind of spreading in every which direction. Um, this one is, a, again, this is something that you can really separate on the basis of, of gestalt too. It's not really too hard to um, separate them on just how they look, basically, is, is what that means. So there's that flange on the uh, oak, ochria. This one here is amphibia, the first one here. <clears throat> and um, there's the top of the leaf. Here's the bottom of the leaf. Uh, if you look real close on this, you, you can sometimes see some oppressed hairs. And there again, you see in this picture here, the inflorescences are at the very top, very tip. Uh, there's a branch right there. So sometimes they're paired, sometimes they're single, but they're always right at the very top. Again, other persicaries would have inflorescences coming out of these leaf ax ax axles going further down. So kiss me over the garden gate looks like this. It's a bigger plant, it has bigger leaves yet, even much bigger leaves. And again, it has that uh, flange at the top of the ochria, Persicaria orientalis, again, is what we're looking at here. And you can see how nodding the inflorescences are here. Both of them are going to have the, the very bright pink color, though. Okay, so let's take a look at our next one. So now, again, we're, we're going to pick up with six here. And six was again uh, the comes from four B here again, which didn't take us in the same direction as five. Of course, um, the the ochria lack that flange like tip or margin along the top. The leaves are usually more linear, more lanceolate. They're not nearly as broad. Um, the bases are usually more truncate or chordate. And again, the main one again is inflorescence are terminal and axillary. And of course, again, colors are not quite as bright pink. So that's gonna take us to six. And now we're gonna separate them on this real important characteristic that's used, uh, whether or not the ochria have any bristles along the top margin. So ochria is here, says they don't. Ochria entire along the margin are nearly so lacking bristles. Sometimes there can be some really small, minute little cilia or extensions from the veins, but they're gonna be really small, less than a millimeter. Uh, the opposite characteristic is the ochria with very obvious erect bristles along the margin, anywhere from one to 12 millimeters in height. And there's also usually some hairs, oppressed hairs or other bristles on the ochre as well. So that's going to separate them into two groups. Seven is the one again without those bristles. The ochre is entire. That's going to take us to um, three species here. Seven uh, is going to take us to the possibility of these three right here, because the other one here takes us to nine. Um, which is going to bypass, again, these three species. So we've already talked about amphibia. So this is just where this, this is where amphibia keys out the second time, just in case you need it. 
The two new species here are two really common and important uh, species of Persicaria, uh, Lepathifolium and Pennsylvanica. Both of these again have an ochre that does not have any bristles coming off the top margin. So I'm really mostly interested in how Lepathifolium and Pennsylvanica are different here. And um, it's basically this first one here, 7A and 7B, that separate them because you, you can see 7A comes out to Lepathifolium. So one difference is in the number of tepals. Lepathiform generally has four, can have five in some cases, whereas um, Pennsylvanica usually has five, but again, can have four. But the, there's a couple other really important characteristics here, so you don't really have to depend on that one. If you have uh, fruits, then it's going to be very easy. Uh, the pathofolium usually has inflorescence that are arched or nodding. And Pennsylvanica, they can be slightly arched. So maybe you might have something that sort of looks like that. But to be really sure, what you can do is look at the tepals. The outer tepals, again, remember there's three outer tepals and two inner ones, or in this case, there's two and two. The uh, veins are very distinctly forked and have sort of recurved tips that make them look like an anchor. You have to have, it helps to have a hand lens to, to see this. And I'll show you this in just a little bit. Whereas again, uh, Pennsylvania does not have that. The outer tepals with veins that are just branching in an irregular way. They don't have any kind of uh, anchor shape to them. They actually become very obscure and you really can't see the veins very much as you get towards the margin of the tepals. So let's take a look at that. Uh, um, here's the first one here is um, Lepathifolium. So here again is what we're talking about with that ochria that does not have any bristles along the top right there. Fairly tall one. This is all uh, elongated ochria. Uh, I will say another thing. Uh, I've just noticed that the, and we'll see it on Pennsylvania too, but the sheathing at the base of this, so there's a leaf right here. This is the petiole of a leaf. I, I cut it off here to get a close up here, but this is the petiole, the base of the petiole of a leaf. And so the leaf again is joining the stem here to node. And there's a sheath here that kind of wraps around. And that's why some people think the okri is an extension of that. But this is a, this, the sheaths here are very robust looking, I guess I would say. And they often have very distinct veins on them. That seems to be a very common characteristic for uh, Lepathifolium, <clears throat> which, by the way, is called pale smart weed or nodding smart weed. But here are the leaves. Again, the top surface, bottom surface, so very long and lanceolate. Again, not anything like the leaves we saw in water smart weed or uh, kiss over the garden gate. Here is, uh, again, those drooping inflorescences. See, they can be somewhat pinkish. Uh, again, they're supposed to not supposed to be quite as bright and reddish or pinkish as um, water smart weed, but it can be slightly pinkish. And here is what the... Um, Teeples, the outer teeples look like. And you can see those anchors right there right now. I'll, I'll color one in for you. Right there's one right there. That's a very distinct mark. Whereas Pennsylvania, which is um, goes by the name of pink weed or common smart weed, you can see again, most of these are fairly erect not quite as drooping as these over here. Now, it kind of just depends. This one's a little bit drooping, but so that's the characteristic that is a little bit um, vague, maybe. Its leaves are gonna be very similar. You're not gonna be able to tell them apart on the basis of their leaves. The okri are pretty similar, fairly tall again. Both of these again have no bristles along the top part of the okri right here. Uh, what I've noticed again is that the sheath on Pennsylvania does not seem to be as robust as the sheath is over here. But there's another really good characteristic that you can use for Pennsylvania that's vegetative. And that's all of these stalk glands. 
that are right below the inflorescence. On oh, this is the this is the peduncle of the inflorescence. So it's this part right in through here. This part right in through, maybe even some of this down through here. That part of the stem or the peduncle will be loaded up with these very obvious stalk glands. And this plant over here, Lepathiform does not have that. Pennsylvanica does. And it can be light pinkish too, or white. Okay, um, let's take a look at the next part of the key. So we have keyed out uh, Lepathiform and Pennsylvanica. Again, that was because we had this character that said, you know, the the ochria are entire. This one back here. Now we're going to go to nine, which again is the one with the ochre. Have these bristles, very obvious bristles along the top. Now it's going to take us to the last um, five species here. So nine, right here, is where you want to be, and we're going to all the rest of these down here have bristles uh, along the top of the ochre. Now we're going to take the first split here by looking at the tepals. And whether or not there's, and this takes a hand lens usually, but whether there's little dots on the tepals. And those little dots are little glands. So the tepals dotted with these little minute glands, that's going to take us to 10. And we're going to either have one of these two species right here. If the tepals do not have those gland dots, this says that rarely a few glands might be present at the base of hydropyperoides. Um, but generally you don't, again, you don't see them, then um, that's going to take us to these three down, or these, yeah, these three down here, hyperpiperoides, longicida, and maculosa. Uh, takes us down to 11, which starts right here. So we're going to take a look at hydropiper and punctata first. Again, they come up nicely on a, on a page together. So here's punctata. Both punctata and hydropiper are going to be pretty similar, just gestalt-wise in terms of the plant. Here's a good look at that ochria, and you see those very obvious bristles coming off the top of the ochria right here. Here's a look at the leaves. Again, they're not going to help a lot. You have to look at the tepals, and now you can see those all those little look like little pits almost, tiny little pits or dots. Those are the little glands on the tepals. There's the white flowers. And here is how you are going to separate punctata from hydropiper, because both of these are gonna have those glands. You have to open up the, um, We'll take a closer look at the fruit, pull the seat, pull the tepals away. Here again, you can see these dried out tepals with all the little dots on them. You gotta get the tepals out of the way and look at the akeen. The akeen here is going to be very shiny. Whereas if you look at hydropiper, one thing that, and this is in the key, uh, this again, it's, it's a little bit helpful, but there's always the possibility of, of you know, um, variation within an individual, within a species, and there's also the probability of just environmental influence here. But generally, the inflorescences on hydropiper are more lax and droopy looking, whereas punctata are a little bit more erect looking, for what it's worth. And, I, and another thing I've noticed with um, hydropiper is that it seems to have more reddish coloration. Um, on the ochre, on the stems in places, there just seems to be more reddish showing up. There again are the tepals with the glandular dots, so you can't tell them apart based on that. So far, we haven't really seen a whole lot that helps us split them. There's a closer look at the inflorescence. There is what you have to look at. There is the akeen. You pull the tepals away from a mature fruit, and you can see the akeen. This keen has a very rough 
uh, texture look to it. The um, key, I believe, uses the term, oh, let's see what it uses here. So a keying with size granular or cellular in appearance appearing roughened is hydropiper again. The keying smooth and glossy is punctata. And here's the one about the inflorescences, usually nodding versus erect or nearly so. Uh, I don't know about this one, the okeoli. Um, I'll show you what those are in just a little bit here. That's another one that is possibly uh, provides a bit of a difference here. Um, I'm not sure we can see them really well. Let's see if we can see them here. Mm, the ocreoli are like a like an ocrea that subtends the flowers and fruits. The ocrea, remember, is down here on the vegetative part of the plant where the nodes and leaves are. The leaves are attached to that nose. The ocrea is here. The ocreoli are the sort of the similar kind of thing, but it's up in the inflorescence at the base of each flower, at the base of each fruit. It's kind of hard to see them here, but we'll, we'll see them on um, another slide coming up. Okay, so uh, we're getting down to the last end here. We have now just these three species left when we go to the tepals not glandad, not with glands or not dotted with glands. That's gonna take us to 11 here again. And there's what I put here, I put two ways of keying it. So this first one here, 11A, 11B, we see this one's going to separate out hydropiperoides from longiceta and maculosa, excuse me, mac maculosa. Uh, I put an alternative couplet in here for 11 and 12 using a different characteristics. And this one, it separates out maculosa first. And then it separates longiceta and hydropiperoides. So you have two different choices here, just different characteristics, but we'll go ahead and use this one first. Um, so this one here uses the size of the inflorescences, over three centimeters long, slender, loosely flowered, styles three, Achenes trigonus, meaning again, they're three-sided. This one is saying that the inflorescences are less than three centimeters. Uh, one to three, they can be as small as just a half of a centimeter long. They're more densely flowered then, rather than being loosely flowered, is mainly just two styles, and Keen's more lenticular. Now, this one gets a little bit iffy, and that's why I put these two in here, because um, longa, longa Cita usually is three-sided. The Keen's are three-sided. Uh, so... Um, that's a little bit of a problem here. Uh, this one is, the other way this separates out is that, again, hydropyperoides is a perennial with right rhizomes. Uh, peduncles and stems, glabrous, now well, to more or less densely to grow. So that, there's a lot of variation there and that doesn't help much. But these are annuals, longiceta and maculosa. Uh, they're not gonna have rhizomes, they're not gonna be a perennial, they're gonna have a, a small taproot. So that's kind of the basis for separating uh, this one from these two. And then the way that these two are pretty much always separated, Longiceta and Maculosa, are the bristles of the Ocreoli. And we'll take a look at those. These, this one has bristles that are very distinct and very long, 2 to 3.5. Again, the keys are mostly three-sided. Uh, and for Maculosa, the bristles of the Ocreoli uh, are much shorter, and the keens are usually two-sided, usually lenticular, but there can be some that are three-sided. Um, again, and again, this one is is it's using the inflorescence diameter first to separate out maculosa from the other two. So now we're going to just use the width of the inflorescence here, um, and then we're going to use the bristles again here, being shorter than the bristles on the ocreoli here. And again, the inflorescence here is, is quite a bit less in diameter, two to eight versus seven to 12. Then the way longiceta and hydropyperoides is, are separated from each other, again, is annual versus perennial, taproots with, versus rhizomes. Again, it's kind of the same thing we saw up there. Um, the 
and then the size of the bristles on the ocreoli. So let's take a look at those. Here is um, maculosa and longicida. So let me pull up here, I guess. So again, here's maculosa. This, these again have rochia that have bristles on them. We're not part of the key. Um, pretty wide inflorescence. Again, this, these have an inflorescence that's over, it's like seven millimeters wide or so. So the inflorescence is fairly thick. Here again, sometimes these have a, a purple splotch on the leaves, as we can see right here. Some, you know, so, but that doesn't always help, as I said. There's a close up of the flowers. And here's a the keen. Typically, the keens are lenticular most of the time. And I just wanted to show again a picture of the sepal, or excuse me, the tepals here, because these, these tepals do not have any glands on them. That was another way you know, that separates this species from, from punctata and hydropiper, is it does not have any glands. Now let's take a look at Longicida. You know, it's going to look pretty similar uh, to Maculosa. Supposedly, again, the inflorescences aren't quite as wide in diameter. So one thing that's, that is not mentioned in the key, but it seems to be useful is, because this kind of goes along with the Ocreoli, which we're going to look at here in just a little bit. But the Ocrea, down here, the bristles on Maculosa are pretty short. And the bristles over here on Longicida are much longer. The leaves are a little bit more broadly, uh, broadly lanceolate, you might say. So there's a bit of a difference there. But again, what the key uses is this. So here again is a close-up of the flowers. And again, each of these flowers has a very small ochrea type of structure. It has a different name. It's called the ocreoli. This term right here, ocreoli, that's this little structure right here. Again, the ocreoli on Longicida has very conspicuous bristles. You can see these bristles very easily. See them right there? These, these bristles are, are two and a half millimeters or more long. We don't see any bristles over here. This is about the same perspective, but this has the ocreoli over here. I don't have a close up enough of them here, but the ocreoli over here have very sh short bristles, a millimeter at, at the most or so. So that's, that is the main way of separating maculosa from longicida. And again, this is also the way of separating um, longicida from hydropiperoides. The uh, bristles and hydropiperoides are not quite this long but they're longer than the ones over here. That's it. That's all of our persicaria. So you can go out now and uh, do wetland surveys. So most of these uh, persicaria cores are blooming uh, towards the end of the growing season. Uh, that's one thing that um, very important when I do floristic inventories and such is that I always, always have to make sure you're doing some uh, surveys pretty much in August and into September, because if you need to have fruits, and in some cases you do, obviously, you need to um, be looking at them towards the end of the growing season. Early in June, July, you, it's really hard to tell which species you've got. Any questions? I don't see any in the chat right now, but if anybody has any, you can type them in or feel free to unmute. You can unmute and ask. Yeah. Um, somebody asked if you could go to the hydropyperoides and talk about the picture of the leaf. Of the leaf? Yeah. All right. So going back to. Hydro, so hydro, hydropiperoides, it has an oides in the end there. I always have to try to remember to say. All right, whoops. Sorry, I went too far there. Where is it at? 
So this one right here. Oh, yeah. So there's a leaf on it. It has it can have a remember these purple splotches can be there or may not be there. Uh, this one is just showing it has some pretty significant short um, pubescence. I guess I would probably look like looks like that's a little bit like stragos. Um, they're probably not real soft, but that is another might be helpful. I'm not sure if that how helpful that characteristic is myself, but one thing I didn't mention that is helpful. Um, another thing with hydropyperoides I didn't mention is that the pu the the petioles on the leaves are very pubescent, as long as well as the leaf blades here, and I found that to be somewhat helpful with hydropyperoides. But another thing, sometimes when I'm trying to tell punctata apart from hydropiper, and maybe you don't have, so in order to use the fruits, those two akines, and again, see whether it's shiny, let me go to that one. Whether you've got a shiny fruit or a rough textured fruit, you have to have mature fruits. And sometimes you don't, you know, if it's too early, you don't have that. But you might be able to tell that it's one of the two species because you can see the sepals, excuse me, you can see the tepals, and you can see they have glands on them. But inside the tepals here, the fruit's not mature. So one thing you can do is just take a, a bit of that leaf and pop it in your mouth and start chewing on it because hydropiper, you will get a hot pepper sensation in about a minute. And that won't happen with punctata. It's called hydropiper and pepper, pepper smart weed um, for a reason. Have you ever found if the hydropiperoides has a bit? I haven't ever, I haven't done a taste test on that. <laughs> I've definitely tasted hydropiper and it gets hot. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It does have a hot. In fact, you, you should do that only if you have some water with you, probably. So you can rinse your mouth out, um, you know, and, and cool it down some. Now, I don't know if hydropyperoides has that. I have, it doesn't have the punctate uh, tepals, you know, so you don't really have to um, separate it, you know, from punctata that way, at least. Uh, I don't know for sure. It, it's it's called mild. Uh, one of the common names for it is mild water pepper. So that kind of suggests maybe it has a little bit of a, of a peppery uh, sensation, but not as much as hydropiper. Not sure. Uh, somebody asked on the distribution maps for non-native species, what does purple color on Minnesota mean? Yeah, purple color in Minnesota means it's listed as a noxious weed. The count of that state or the county, I guess it's a, it's a state thing. So the state has a has declared has declared that species to be a noxious weed, which of course means that landowners are required to, at least in Iowa, it means landowners are required to control it somehow. That's that's what the purple color means. Is that which one is that for? That's for um let's see. Oh, that's for maculosa. Yeah, right now, but... maculosa. So they have they up there feel it's somewhat of an invasive species, apparently, then. Which I said, you know, it it in some places. I don't know why they've got Pennsylvania purple. That's odd. I guess you can have a native species that's also a noxious weed. I guess that's true. I think in Iowa, that's well, in Iowa, that's definitely true because we've got some native vessels that are used to be noxious weeds, at least. I don't think they are anymore, but good question. You see that for two species in Minnesota. Um, Stephen asks if he should bring up. Periscaria bicornis. Bicornis? Well, that is a species, I believe, that's found in Missouri. Um, let me see. Um, 
by Cornus is I'm looking it up here real quick. I'm going to get to the right um, section. Unfortunately, there's there's five sections within Persicaria. Uh, it's in an FNA makes it harder to track down. So by Cornus, oh, it's listed as for Iowa. In FNA, it's not in uh, Iris and Rosa, of course. I didn't catch that one. Uh, it's listed as um, so. There must be some. Uh, must be a voucher. It's not in. Um, I don't know if it's in Bonab. I was going to say on your tape, you do have um, a synonym of P. Bicorn for Persicaria Pennsylvanica, but that. The bicorn be different than bicornus. <laughs> that could be a factor. Yes, it sometimes it's those synonyms. There's so many of them in persicarias. Yeah, that sometimes uh, presents problems. So Bonap has has about five counties in Iowa identified for it. That must be some new some fairly recent observations or something, because others and also didn't have reports, but, well, that's a new one to, to look at. Um, not sure what that one looks like for sure. Let me see real quick where he's at. It's, it is in Missouri. And so, Well, it keys out right next to Pennsylvania. Yeah, it must. It might be. Uh, well, FNA does treat it as a separate species, but it keys out right next to Pennsylvania, so it's going to be very similar to it. The thing that separates it from Pennsylvania. Looks like um, you have to look at the fruits. The fruits with a with plate with the faces flat to slightly convex, but one of the faces, usually with a central hump, is bicornis. If the fruits have the faces somewhat concave, none of the faces with a central hump. That's Pennsylvania. So boy, that's good to know because that means every single Pennsylvania you have, you have to look at. Uh, you have to look at those more carefully because it looks like up to that point, they must look fairly similar. And another- Well, split. I have to, have to fix my, my uh, table here. <laughs> and another- uh... He, he also splits the stamens or styles are exerted flowers heterostylus, which would be the uh, bicormis. And mm -hmm. then who's or, doing that? This is uh, Ackerfield in Colorado. Oh, in Colorado. Yeah, I see yeah. It is it's more of a Western species. Yeah, just it, basically right in between us and you. It looks like right. maybe there's some in your county. Heterostylus. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, versus Homo stylus were the stamens and styles included, which I actually don't know what that really means yet. I think I've well, this that. is this is saying too that uh, for bicornis plants of two kinds within a population, some plants with the stamens exerted and others with the styles exerted. So heterostylus means that there's um, oh yeah yeah there's different timing of when the either styles or stamens are, I think, um, ready, you know, to do their thing basically. So okay. two kinds within, so yeah, some plants with the stamens exerted and others with the style exerted. That that would take looking at a lot of plants, not quite as easy. And, and 
if you're working from a voucher, not very helpful probably, uh, although you might see that some of them only have one or the other, because it says that for Pennsylvania, then plants all similar. Well, either with neither the stamens or styles exerted, or I suppose with both of them exerted. It doesn't say that, but. I wonder what, yeah, I have to look and see what FNA, uh, how FNA split, splits them out. Um, let's see what that does. They must come out close together here too. Yeah, in FNA, they come out right side by side. Uh, and they're using that. So flowers, homostylus, akenes without a central hump. On one side is Pennsylvanica. Flowers heterocylus, akenes usually with a central hump on one side. So yeah, you can use um, either of those, I guess. Usually the first one that's listed is supposedly the one that's supposed to be the most helpful, which is the homo versus heterostylus. So um, yeah, heterostyly, flowers of a species having different style links and different stamen links. That, that's also common in um, some of the uh, Lysimachias, I believe, or no, some of the primulas versus homo stylus would be uh, that they're all the same. Homo stylus plants with monomorphic flowers in which the stigmas and anthers are held at about the same level. So the height is what we're talking about there. Yeah, the heights. And that's why some are exerted and some aren't. So heterostylus means that the stamens are taller than the styles and the stamens come out on some plants, on, on some flowers of some plants and on other plants it's reversed. The styles are taller than the stamens. And so the styles come come out. Just a, it's, it's, a, it's a strategy, it's a mechanism. I should say not a strategy per se, but a mechanism for plants that are trying to avoid selfing, trying to avoid um, for, for, you know, pollinating themselves basically and trying to encourage uh, more uh, out pollination, being pollinated by an individual that's not a relative. Because in another plant that has the same pattern of style, height and stamen height would likely be more related to it. And so the idea is that when they're different heights, then that means a pollinator visiting either of these flowers, it, it, can, it can transfer pollen more easily from a plant where it picks up the stamen, or excuse me, it picks up the pollen from a short stamen because it's probably getting it like on its belly or something. And then it can transfer that better to a plant that has a short style, which would be a different, would be a, you know, the, probably a plant that's not as related. I didn't know that was a mechanism that um, Persicaria uh, used. Well, we'll have to look at the herbarium at Iowa State, I guess. I'll have to talk to Deb and see what how, if, we, if we do have some vouchers of Bicornius. Um, apparently we do because both FNA and Bonap do say that um, now, uh, what I would question, they both say it's native to Iowa, but um, I wonder about that. The The number of counties in Bonap was only like five, and they were just kind of scattered around different places. It didn't look like it had uh, like a natural extension of a range from the, from the west. Anything else? We have uh, one last question. Any that? good tips for differentiating Rumex from Periscaria when not in flower? Oh, Rumex from Persicaria. That's a good question. When they're not flowering. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a little bit difficult. Let me think about that for a second. Oh, let's see. Well, they both have okria, of course. I think um, there's probably not much of a difference there. 
it kind of depends. Um, well, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you for sure. I guess I'll have to look that up and, and send uh, an answer to Lance and look at that a little bit more closely and think about that a little bit uh, to get you the right answer. Um, I do a kind of gestalt wise. And, and that's always hard to explain then what it is I'm looking at there. It's the, it's a combination of the leaves to some extent, the size of the leaves. Uh, a lot of Rumex will have more basal leaves, more so than Persicaria. Um, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, I'll put together an answer and send it to Lance. You can share with everybody. Yep, sounds good. Okay. Well, uh, we I was just gonna say we have a, like a two week break now before the last one, right? Yep. Yeah, so three weeks from tonight, we will be looking at prairie seedlings. I've got two meetings coming up the next two weeks on Thursday night, so. Well, thanks again for everyone uh, for coming by and sharing some time with us here. Good to see uh, some names on the screen there and a few faces, so. Hopefully this has helped a little bit with your Persic areas. Bye. Thanks, Tom. See ya. Okay.